All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick, recording Monday afternoon leading up to Nick's Paces, Timberwolves, Nuggets. Uh, as we're recording, don't know if Rudy Gobert is going to make it to the game. Um, we have a group chat that is lighting up with potential flight paths from Minnesota <laughs> um, to Denver, uh, which I thought we were past after Shohei Otani didn't sign with the Blue Jays, but we're back on flight path bet. Um, today, we're going to tackle some questions from listeners uh, in our AMA, then we'll talk a little Mavs Thunder and uh, PSG Dortmund. But let's start off, Drew, with a question from our friend, uh, The Gentleman. I know you mentioned rough patches, but would love for you to discuss not losing confidence in your modeling or handicapping process versus fixing something that may be fundamentally wrong in your process. Mm. Uh, well, funny enough, I watched the gentleman on uh, the airplane out of Louisville. Uh, great uh, uh, Guy Ritchie movie from back in 2019 and leads into a new Guy Ritchie series, which is uh, pretty entertaining as well. That was my, uh, that was my uh, in-flight entertainment going home uh, after the Derby. But uh, it's, this is a really good question, and I want to try to answer this in a couple of different ways. Uh, and I'll start out with uh, saying that you need a meaningful sample size where you are still beating the market and you know kind of whatever your approach is that's a little bit different that is getting you an edge um you know the market is still coming with you but the results that you're doing as you're auditing your own performance are telling you that that not, not, you know you're losing and you know it's not luck right like that's kind of the key is separating luck from results you almost never want to be results based entirely you want to have some sort of framework where you're like okay um this was my expected pace in this game. This was my expected offensive and defensive efficiency. This was my expected shooting percentages, right? Like the, this is what we were expecting. This is what happened. And then you, from there, you can do a pretty careful, uh, you know, put those two up side by side and say, it was a good bet. It was a bad bet. And if you have enough bad bets stacked up, but the market is coming with you, then what's happening in my mind is there's probably somebody else out there who has figured out, you know, some other kind of key, um, you know, aspect to, um, uh, you know that when the, the market will eventually stop coming with you and that's kind of the sign where it's like okay no somebody else out there has the keys has sort of the um you know the more well-functioning algorithm they're crunching the data more effectively and uh, that's when it's it, very important to uh pivot off your process right uh some losing streaks are luck based i feel like i'm kind of mired in one that's somewhat luck based right now um you know if you lose if you lose a massive play on an under because the game goes to overtime like <laughs> you can't I can just throw your hands up like, hey, this happens, right? You, if you lose a tennis match when, you know, your your opponent had match point on serve and hit just an all time serve and, you know, the, the the returning player just happened to get it back in in play. And then ultimately then leads, leads to a lose like you played a dog price. You had a good bet. You know, you, you live with those sort of things. And so um, it's imp like you, it, as long as you have a kind of a consistent process where you're looking at results and you're separating luck from um, you know, what's actually happened from a results standpoint, then I think you're in pretty good chance, you know, pretty good shape to make some of those decisions. And I'm always, I'm constantly listening to other content of people who have what I would either consider an informational edge and an X's and O edge, or, you know, just in general are looking through at the game that I'm handicapping with a little bit of a different prism, right? It's just a slightly different lens. And, uh, you know, the times where I'm questioning things the most is sort of when I lean into that the hardest, just to sort of hear someone who's not kind of in the mud, in the muck, losing money. <laughs> like, what is their perspective on what's happening in this series? What's happening in this matchup? What's happening in this sport? Um, and, uh, you know, so I think those are kind of the tools and the uh, kind of methodologies that I use to try to help uh, stop a, a losing stretch. And, um, you know, again, like if it's bad process and bad luck that are combining and, you know, you're you're really in a hurt, then uh, I think that's when you basically just need to take some time away from, from the handicap. Yeah, I think this question is probably more relevant for someone if you're, you know, you're basing your betting um, career or interest off of, you know, trying to beat lines and totals and doing, you know, player-based models um, and having to test um, against the market constantly. For someone like me, who's mainly betting, um, you know, futures markets and player markets and awards and like my, like I'm betting Nas Reed at 150 to one when he's 13 to when I think he should be 13 to one. So there's a fair bit of margin for error baked in there where like, if I'm wrong on that, then like I'm very, very wrong. Um, 
and I think that it's more this kind of process and evaluation of process is probably more relevant when you're betting thinner margins. Um, and I was talking um, about this with someone at lunch just before actually about how like there's basically there are two ways to win. One is by solving the hardest markets with a lot of liquidity and the other is trying to beat softer markets and your struggle is getting the liquidity. Um, and the former, I think this question is probably more applicable to, I think for the most part, like you can generally evaluate, you know, post after the fact, whether you got in good or not. Like uh, last year, I had a big bet after the Celtics went down 3-0 to the Heat in the Eastern Conference Finals, I had a big bet on the Celtics at 25-1 to to win the title. Um, just on the idea that this is a pretty solvable market now, that you can just kind of multiply out what the projected money lines will be four times against Miami and then Boston's average price in the finals. And that bet ended up going down uh, at hurdle four um, after they lose game seven. But based on what the money line prices were and based on what they were going to be in the finals, that was a good bet. Just lost. That's fine. Um, but that like evaluating going back like that, I think is useful. But yeah, for, for the most part, um, yeah, this is super relevant when you're dealing um, with fine margins. Um, yeah. Anything else that you wanted to hit around this, Drew? Well... I guess uh, I should qualify my belly aching and being, you know, pity party that I'm throwing myself on our podcast regularly now is it's somewhat exaggerated. Like I hit every series bet I made in round one of the NBA playoffs. Uh, that all cashing has kept kept me, you know, fairly liquid without really much stress, other than you know the um, you know the the emotional toll that comes along with uh, you know being wrong on an information market like the draft, which is embarrassing, being wrong on the Derby when you spend, you know, all of these hours handicapping one race and it's horses and there's 20 of them, right? Like, you know, like there, there's, there are, uh, you know, certain aspects to being, you know, kind of a publicly facing part of the conversation when it comes to gambling that uh, just it, it exaggerates, it makes the winning more fun and it makes the losing tougher. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I've gotten to the place where I stick to my process and my my particularly my evaluation of results, looking at it through the lens of luck, taking tra taking luck out. Um, and if you have a way to do that, then I think you're going to find that uh, you know the the highs and lows start to flatten out a little bit, right? And that's really all that you can ask for, especially if you actually have an edge. I think. Yeah, it is funny being you know in in our position it's not like and it's not like we're leonardo dicaprio walking down the street in los angeles or whatever but when you do take <laughs> kind of public stances you do sure. in a weird way you feel the wins and losses a little bit more of like course. i have people i have um sure you won't mind me saying this you know greg rosenthal the nfl guy came up to me in a restaurant being like sorry about joe flacco like yeah. i don't know i've never met you before <laughs> <laughs> it's like you never spoken to you in my life um and but at the same time, it makes you know when you do get wins pub that you publicly yeah. talk about, it makes them more fulfilling. Um, and it's not so much the monetary aspects. Like there's a lot of stuff that I bet on that you know I don't really talk about in a public facing forum because no one really wants to hear about my bets on who's going to get relegated in Syria or whatever. But <laughs> um, it, those form as much of my portfolio as the as the Nas Reed and Demar Hamlin stuff. But yeah, that is. It is a strange aspect, um, which is a little artificial, but certainly yeah. plays into how you feel about wins and losses. The only other thing I want to say about this is that I will say in terms of process and losing confidence or not, I think a big advantage that um, I've developed or cultivated or improved over the past few years is that I probably have more of a network now of just people to bounce ideas off yeah. where I can be like, am I crazy that i think that kobe white should be this price or nas reed should be this price or gobert should be this price or whatever and then i will just kind of gain consensus from enough people that you know i'm not crazy and then that kind of reinforces that yeah. all right i've been betting for x amount of years i've won at x percentage so that gives you a certain confidence and then you know other people who also win and have done over a long period of time and then you're if you're all arriving at the same consensus its process is probably pretty rock solid. So I think that developing a network of people who Surely. win and who you respect um, is very important because it's a lot it's a lot more difficult doing this in isolation. No, I that is a really great point. Um, 
final thought on this uh, and the public this is sort of going back more to the public facing aspect of it like um the other thing that you end up the more reps you do of this sort of talking about what you bet the better you get at articulating your point right and there may be some there are some edges we talk about where i'm like i think this is an edge <laughs> right but you say it like the super bowl is a great example right like this is you know the the edge between the chiefs and the niners you are everyone who watched that game i would hope came out of that saying wow that was really close <laughs> right everyone who came out of the previous super bowl against eagles i hope they would say wow that was really close and like if you 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 do enough interviews that week that you're just like snowball rolling downhill and the last interview you do it may sound like the most confident bet anyone's ever made in history just because all of your points are so finely detailed you know what has landed what it hasn't and when you've talked to other people and so now you have like this airtight like closing argument you know so to speak for the jury and uh, i always kind of try to cool it down at that point because somebody's going to listen to that and they could listen to your conf level of confidence and be like wow well they're absolutely right i'm going to get a little bit more involved than i ought to in this game because that was so compelling and uh i think uh you know i would hope that everybody who's kind of listening to us recognizes at least that you know we do our best to um talk about this from a probabilistic standpoint we're not ever really ever i'm never blowing smoke on i think this is a bet and then not actually betting it myself or at least you know kind of coming up with uh you know ways to what capitalize on what we think are edges so um yeah it's it's uh it's fundamentally uh tricky uh doing this but it's also uh hugely fun when we do get things right and uh hopefully that'll be uh sooner than later in this nba playoffs <laughs> yeah. i think it also like it depends on the market type like if you know if yeah. we say that we like cav series price against the magic like we're talking about minus 190 on minus yeah. 25 fair or whatever <laughs> yeah. whereas there are going to be other markets like you know we'll talk about certain niche cycling events or i'm sure there'll be lots of stuff in the olympics where it's like you know th this is plus 300 in the market and we think it should be like minus 180 or something um and i do think you know not to blow smoke for us but like when we do take strong positions like we do generally back that up with our own money and oh, we, no. do, we do lose um substantially if we are wrong about something <laughs> yes. but at least we're putting celtics warriors is a very recent example that was and that is one where a third quarter of game four i was ready to freaking start hanging banners man i was, I was like it's coming like this is it they're gonna win this game and it's coming and then steph curry flips the switch and it was over and i will go to my grave and i will bet that edge every single time it comes along and a, in a good percentage of those times steph curry's not going to turn into the greatest player of all time for that quarter and really flip the game so um yeah and this that kind of goes back to the key point of this all which is you got to have a, a post you have a you have to have a post result process that takes the actual result out of the picture and really just looks at what was luck what was real what can you take moving going forward yep no for sure and i think like the biggest thing is simply that uh i can't remember the exact quote but peter king interviewed eli manning after the second super bowl where he throws the pass to mario manningham and eli just gives a variation of the idea that <laughs> you know you have to be okay throwing the pass knowing that there is a chance that it's going to get picked sixth in the super bowl and you're going to go down in flames but so long as you made the right decision at the moment it's pretty easy to live with the consequences so ultimately That's like true. all we are doing is just trying to <laughs> we're just trying to flip slightly loaded coins um yes. and on Thank balance you. of probability they'll land in our favor and really the, the key is is just trying to find as many coins as possible and then hopefully some um are heavier um than others all right uh question from uh dunga Jin. what's your least favorite sport to watch but you have the greatest advantage in Ooh, um not I, this is gonna sound crazy but at this moment it's the nfl i thought the nfl product last year was terrible i thought there were a lot of unwatchable games i had a lot of uh, you know, my most favorite part of the NFL process last year was really just watching the condensed, you know, recaps and finding specific parts of games to kind of key on instead of sitting through the, uh, you know, the slog of some of the, uh, some of the stuff we had, particularly the, uh, the Thursday packages, which were just a real, uh, rough hang last year. So, um, some of it was the quality of quarterback play and hopefully that as these young players come in and start thriving and 
get better, then all of it flips on a dime. But at the current stand, edge for NFL relative to how much I enjoyed watching the games last year didn't really tie. Um, I love watching tennis. I, I will sit down and watch tennis every morning with my coffee and, and the European clay. It has been just a very, very fun spring in that regard. Uh, and uh, NBA, I I would say that would that's that those are the only three sports I have an edge on, if we're being honest. <laughs> and so th- I have to pick one of three. I'm picking the NFL. Uh, I would put the NFL ahead of the NBA only only if uh, you know the quarterback play gets better. Otherwise, the NBA is tougher for me to watch just because I don't have underpinnings of understanding what's going on on the court the way I would with tennis and then NFL. So um, it's a it's a close call. But for me right now, with quality of the product. And the NBA feels very good, other than Mavs, Cavs, I mean, other than Cavs uh, Magic, <laughs> but uh, uh, but the NFL needs to needs to pick it up a little bit. It's funny because I think my favorite sport to watch that I have um, a large bet on is now actually like NHL playoffs. Just so, okay. something about the kind of cadence of the sport, the fact that it's three periods, the periods go by fairly quickly and action is continuous. It's not stop start like football or, or basketball. It's like continuous and obviously there are breaks, but it feels continuous within the period. And then you get a 20 minute break to exhale and it's 20 minutes and then you're back in it for real pace. Uh, and so just kind of know what I'm signing up for. It's going to be exhilarating. <laughs> it's going, there is going to be swings that happen rapidly out of nowhere um, games don't really just kind of wither into nothingness unless it's Leafs Bruins game seven. Um, so that is kind of weirdly become my favorite. My least favorite to watch that I may have an advantage in sometimes is college basketball. Like I just like the level of play. I'll never forget having a bet on needing the UTSA Roadrunners to win um, against a team that escapes me, but I don't think they hit the rim in the last five minutes of the game. It's like, what the hell is this? Like, it's, <laughs> absolute, it's not a good product at this point. And some college basketball is a great product. March Madness is a great product, but lower level college basketball, which is often where the biggest edges are, um, can be very not fun uh, if you're betting on a team that just absolutely melts. Yes. Um, no. All right. Just next question. Real quick. From, yeah, real quick. Yeah, uh, Sidebar, uh, the only sport that I will watch and love and I have 0.0 edge on is uh, golf. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh-huh. The Masters was I, – I, I watched so many minutes of the Masters and I loved it even though it was a terrible result for me. And uh, I'm going to do it again next year. <laughs> yep. All right. There you go. Question from Stephen Garrett. Without using real dollar amounts, I'd love to know how each of you thinks about sizing different types of bets. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I think of, uh, basically I'm trying to time, um, my entry into markets with, uh, decent enough liquidity on a single bet before the, without market moving. Um, and, uh, and then getting in before the end bosses get in that close. That's all that really matters to me. And I'm just basically playing a uh, single limit. Uh, midweek NFL, mid morning NBA uh, for sides and totals and live with the limits that I have access to. And if I really feel strongly about something, I'll hit it more than once. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, almost everything I bet will move on screen. Um, and those in NBA and uh, NFL, at least I can find f- more fun ways to get down in tennis without really wrecking prices. But, um, you know, f- fundamentally, I have um, uh, in my staking uh, and just the way limits work, uh, I have I put about the same amount of liquidity into a given week in the NFL as I would uh, into a given week in the NBA as I would into a given week in tennis. And it's not the same number of bets, um, but it is, uh, uh, it's pretty much just kind of overall, that's uh, kind of what I'm comfortable risking at a given week. Um, and when it comes to futures markets bets, I very rarely am ever, um, getting a, enough of a stake down on a single click that I'm really that excited about that. That's more just sort of fun stuff to have on the side to root for from what I can, t- you know, kind of ex- best I can explain it. Um, and I've thought hard about should, you know, if, if, if I have strong performance in futures markets uh, over a given time, I'll think hard about, do I need to find ways to get more money down on this? like Jay does, <laughs> or do I need to, uh, you know, just kind of live with what I can get? Cause 
uh, you know, again, like the mechanics of betting at some point become challenging for a professional or even a semi-professional player. Uh, and uh, uh, I just kind of take what I get. Yep. For the stuff that I'm betting, for the most part, I'm just trying to get down the maximum that I can. Um, yeah. And usually that'll <laughs> pop out at, you know, X amount. Um, but for the most part, I, I'm not betting as much on, like, I think at, at this point, I have a pretty good idea on what I have edges on and what I don't. Uh, and I'm pretty confident in being able to calculate fares for what I'm betting on. And if I'm betting on, you know, something that is, minus 115 uh in the market when i think fair should be minus 130 then obviously i'm going to stake significantly less on that relative to something that is 10 to 1 that i think is you know plus 350 fair or whatever um when i'm betting and also just always more reticent to go bigger on more liquid markets because i think you have to have a kind of fear of the boogeyman there that there is someone out there who is smarter than you who knows what they're doing whereas there are other markets where i'm I'm pretty confident that you know it's just mispriced um and there's not enough liquidity in the market to arrive at anything resembling truth whereas yeah i'm not interested in blasting into an nfl total uh on sunday at 10 45 a.m eastern um, yeah there's there's fear of the boogeyman at close that i don't want to compete with uh and then there's other funny fear of the boogeyman stories real quick that i could tell like um these this never works out never in fact i would i, w- I wish i had an actual list of uh, when this you know what what these are but and so maybe it's just mental you know it's mental games i'm playing with myself but uh i feel like if you if i'm betting into a futures market or a series price or whatever and the market moves and i'm now looking i'm like man i didn't get as much as i i didn't get a, as you know, so, you know message somebody didn't get as much as i wanted on blank uh, it was Grizzlies Lakers last year was a good example, right? Like, oh man, I wanted some Grizzlies at like you know, minus 120 on the open and moved to like 135, 140. And, you know, I'm blabbing about, man, I wish I could get more Grizzlies. And somebody shows up in your mentions or your, you know, your messages who you know. And they're like, I, I heard you want more, more Grizzlies. <laughs> like, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I did say that. <laughs> like, I'll give it to you at this price, right? Mm-hmm. And those deals almost always go have gone against me. Uh, even and you know, some of them it was bad bets on my part, and somebody on the other side had a very good, uh, you know, kind of point of view on the handicap of a game or a series, playoff games, NFL. Another good example where this has happened, where you're doing big free matches with other very skilled players, and that's big game hunting, and it's uh, it's 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 tough. And um, you got to be a little careful stake wise with uh, those type of bets because you don't want those to decide your your season, your postseason, whatever. Um, because uh, yeah, you get a little uh, you get a little loose. Yep, I think the biggest thing with bet sizing is just being cognizant of what market you're betting into uh, and having the confidence that you are right um, relative to your fair um, versus more liquid markets, um, which are going to be harder to beat. All right, question from Dr. Jeff E's cat in Rome, who would meet in Joker in the final draw? Well, Jay, <clears throat> doesn't matter. This Joker's going to beat him. Um, it's probably going to be Sissipas. Uh, I like what I'm seeing from him right now. Uh, I know there is big public news that everybody is hanging on the, uh, you know, hanging on the uh, the Twitter timeline for details on. But uh, Sissipas and Paul Bodosaje amicably amicably broken up. Um, oh, so, so Steph is it was amicable. Yes, it was amicable. Yes, they've had they had a great time. They li- they learned they learned a lot. They loved a lot. It was it was a happy happy feelings all around. Uh, that said, uh, the focus that he's had so far on this clay cycle has been impressive. He's playing at a high level, and I think um, his bottom half of the draw, uh, I I wish I could tell you that it was uh, Nadal, uh, but uh, honestly, him putting together consecutive top-level performances has been elusive to this point uh, in his clay comeback, and if he's not doing it with extra rest, in best of three um you know i'm worried about his uh, ability to sustain at roland garros but in rome djokovic is on top he's gonna have to go th- through a little bit of a tough test rude's on in his quarter uh he'll get he's likely gonna have zverev in the semifinal, and then if i if you know, for my money i think it's probably gonna be sis in the final um and uh, ultimately i think it does not matter because djokovic plus 250 is a bet at that at that price if you can find it and i think um uh this is sort of 
where he rounds into form for Roland Garros if he ever does. And, um, you know, he may have some don't lose confidence if he doesn't look great in his first couple of matches as he sort of gets his uh, playing legs under him. But uh, I think the semi quarterfinals, semifinals, finals here against, you know, high level competition, those three young guys in particular, if that's who he plays, um, he gets wins there. And I think he's probably your, he, he's going to go off as your clear favorite for Roland Garros, considering what's going on with center health, considering what's going on with Alcaraz health, considering what's going on with Nadal in terms of uh, stamina. Okay. Well, speaking of Nadal, question from Zach Palmer. If Djokovic and Nadal were to play today at Roland Garros against each other, let's infer some health from Nadal. Um, how do you see the match playing out? So if this in this setup, this is like it's exhibition-y, but it also probably has sort of like finality for Nadal, right? Like this is the setup is kind of like the last kind of most important match of his career, and he died, digs deep in moments when his body is failing him. So uh, it's tough for me to doubt that Nadal is going to be able to put up a fight. Um, but the um, the realistic price for a match like that is something like Djokovic minus 250, maybe higher, um, maybe minus 280. Uh, best of five, I'm assuming we're doing here. And uh, I think the most likely outcome is probably Djokovic 3-1. Uh, and uh, really, it would be more like Djokovic lets Nadal kind of get some of the get the some of the early momentum of the match and then he takes it away and uh set two pushes him you know really kind of asks him physically uh and then uh, kind of pulls away uh, in minutes sets three and four so um maybe i'm overrating djokovic right now because certainly we have not seen him play a lot of tennis in 2024 and we haven't seen him really play any good tennis in 2024 so <laughs> you could be like man you got a lot of confidence for a guy who's just not playing very much or playing very well uh and i like my answer is like yeah i know but like he's at the stage in his career where all he's really caring about is slams he played too much into last fall which is why he was so poor in Australia, uh, and I think he specifically took that lesson so he could take his foot off the gas uh, through the first half of this year so that he's going to be in peak form when it gets to Wimbledon. I'm sure he cares about Roland Garros as well, and he would love to double those up, but uh, I think uh, it's pretty clear at least he's going to start ramping up here in Rome uh, to try to take home a couple more titles before it's, uh, you know, it's the next generation's turn to shine. Yep. No, uh, that all makes sense to me. All right, with just two matches left, Arsenal continue their fight to stay atop the table when they face Man United at Old Trafford. Tune in this Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, only on Peacock. All right, a couple more questions from uh, Travis. Tom admitted to Deflategate on the roast. Were you on the right side or wrong side <laughs> of the Brady Pats era? And which cocktail slash food won the derby for you? Um, I wasn't really on a side necessarily during the Pats era. Uh, I did lose a decent amount of money on the Pats Rams Super Bowl, um, the, the latter one. I uh, wasn't betting on Pats Rams, uh, the initial one when I was like 10 years old or whatever. Um, but the latter one... Uh, it was very that was a we talk about evaluating process. It was just a bad bet for me. I was betting my opinion too much back then. I thought the Rams would win, they didn't. I think really it's come <laughs> that close. Um, so I think I'm a bit better of a better now that I am then, but that was the only real, I guess, memorable position that I was on in the Brady Pats era. Uh, and then which cocktail food won the Derby for you? Well, what won Derby for me? Um, well, we, we actually, you, know, you weren't really around for this initially, but we went to a bad buffet uh, when we, we had an option of a superior buffet and didn't work mm. out. But I think the cocktail is the, um, the mid julep, clearly, um, which is a little, little bourbon-y, um, but I'm not afraid of a little bourbon-y. Uh, and overall, it was a positive experience. But what about you, Drew? Um, well, the P Pat's Brady era... Uh, I don't know if people know this, but the last teams that I was able to really divorce myself from really being invested in the team success more than just the gambling implications was the Patriots and the Red Sox in football and baseball, respectively. Um, and I had connections to those teams because in my formative years, we moved to Boston. And um, that was when Drew Bledsoe and Bill Parcells got the Patriots to the Super Bowl against the Packers. And I was like, oh, heck yeah, this is awesome. Um, and... Uh, the first kind of winning, real, real deal winning bet I ever had in my life was betting on the Patriots to to win uh, uh, against the Rams in 2001, and I bet on Tom Brady in almost every playoff game he ever 
started. Uh, the only exception was against the Chiefs where he beat them as uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, were just an absolute machine that day. Um, I don't think there was a single other playoff game, including Tampa Bay getting throttled by Dallas in Brady's last playoff game, including Tom Brady getting throttled by Tennessee in his last home Patriots game. I think I don't think I ever played a bet against him in his entire career. And uh, he was he made me more money betting than any other player in football by far. Um, and I think uh, it was cool to see the roast. And if you haven't checked it out, it was a it was a pretty cool overall thing that they pulled off. I don't know how, uh, but uh, everybody had good everybody had a good attitude. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, funny enough about the Deflate Gate part of it, um, I still will laugh to, to my grave because the that market was very very high on Andrew Luck and the Colts that day and. They could eat. They they might as well have been playing with a rugby ball. It did not matter, like what the inflation pressure of those footballs was, and whatever they were doing, and all that time and effort and all that ink spilled, and the you know kind of the t- tearing down of the Brady, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, icon iconic image. Like it's it was all quite silly, I thought, and uh, I'm glad he kind of bounced back and had uh, some Super Bowls in him after that moment, but. Uh, best food and drink at the Derby was uh, the Paddock Club. Um, the Con- Churchill Downs spent $200 million uh, renovating the Paddock area and the Paddock Club. Uh, they also had the neighboring SI Club on either sides of the kind of the tunnel where they bring the horses out onto the track. Um, and uh, honestly, I have never in my all of the years I've gone, I have never once been impressed by the food or the drink there. <laughs> They've always been underwhelming, uh, but it's like all you can eat, all you can drink. So I kind of was just like, ah, whatever, I don't care, you know. And so uh, I just sort of laughed it off. Well, the food and drink at the Paddock Club was on a different level. They had Chilean sea bass. They had a main lobster tail. Um, they had, uh, you know, outstanding salads, outstanding, uh, you know, fare for, you know, it wasn't like ballpark fare. It was like like gourmet. Um, they were popping French champagne. They had French wine. Uh, they had good California wine. I was like, okay, uh, this is uh, this is quite quite a different life, uh, different level of experience. So, uh, money well spent by Churchill Downs upgrading those. And if you are kind of in like sort of the corporate uh, world and you uh, you're getting treated to uh, a derby experience, I would ask for the Paddock Club uh, first and foremost. The uh, the access to just be able to trot down and walk right onto the rail and put your hands in the dirt <laughs> was like also crazy. You're standing out there with the owners and you know the key trainers and everybody the owners boxes are right there uh and uh easy access to the um to the wager window and everything to get your bets in so that was a pretty unbelievable experience okay next question from jordan based on what you saw at the derby what are your early thoughts on the preakness what mm. more surprised you most this weekend uh was it torpedo anna drew uh yes anna was the most surprising for sure um i thought uh the mystic dan result uh was less surprising because we saw him do it once at the southwest and he caught the golden rail uh and made the most of it and that some of that could have been a little bit true about torpedo anna as well and the, you know the fact that you had the same jockey who his you know kind of played into his tactics uh, you know, kind of riding the rail at Churchill Downs and that it happened to be fast because of the rain that uh, came through on Friday. Um, maybe it should not have been a surprise, but the Kentucky Oaks was very, very fast off the first half. And I thought uh, the horses on the lead were just going to get completely cooked uh, and have a difficulty to close. And some very, very good horses were closing in on Anna coming around that final turn and entering the home stretch. And she pulled away to a degree that I had zero clue So that she had in her. So that was amazing. For early look in the Preakness, it starts and ends with Muth. Um, he was one of the most impressive horses in the run-ups to the Kentucky, Der- Kentucky Derby. He wasn't allowed to run in the Kentucky Derby because Baffert is suspended for cheating. Uh, he will run at the Preakness, and he will probably go off as a uh, – I think he's probably going to go off under one-to-one. I think he's going to be in like the one, three to – five-ish range would be my guess he's going to be so heavily bet if you can get a futures pool bet on mooth right now at any price better than plus 100 take it okay there we go and last question around the derby from our friend producer pete how do you alter your betting strategy mm-hmm. for horse racing with the paramutual aspect of it no reward for getting ahead of a line no such thing as clv what changes in your approach 
uh, okay. as, and I yes. skew more to um, humans, as we know, Drew. So uh, <laughs> I'll let you take this one. So he, his his point, if you don't understand, is is a great question, which is the paramutual pool means you don't know the race, the odds of the winner until the money's been counted, and it gets divided up based on the, the number of wagers. And so you can have a late closing push on a given hearse that collapses that price, and you think you're going to get three to one, and it's something much shorter. Um, the uh, interesting thing is. Uh, you can play a lot of futures pools. I did that early and often this year, as we talked about on the show with uh, uh, with Barry. Uh, we played into a horse at 100 to 1 who we thought, yeah, this horse qualifies for the race. He's going to be in the top three. Like, let's get 100 to 1 now uh, and hope he gets there. He didn't, but uh, playing into futures pools is a great way to lock in fixed odds to avoid the paramutual headache. Um, similarly, offshore, they have uh, futures wagers on the Kentucky Derby that you can lock in a price. And um, when I bet Honor Marie to win, it was was off of news of a workout that happened a week and a half before and it was literally just like this horse is expected to be 20 to 1 he just went how fast in the this workout that is very sharp it had progression signal that you know you know it's going to be a popular one on race day um and so it was a pretty obvious answer to just go fire into that market at 22 to 1 and know it was going to be shorter when you got to derby day um the on Derby Day itself, when you start to see a horse that you had eyes for, like Stronghold for me this year, where he was drifting, 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 and like, you know, expected 20 to 1 on the morning line and was just getting no attention, drifted out to 35 to 1. It was like basically like, I didn't expect to have a big bet on Stronghold to win, but here we are. This is not the price that I think is fair. So we fire away. And uh, ultimately, he didn't have a close in him. But otherwise, uh, I thought the process was reasonable. And, um, you know, for those reasons, I think you just have to have an open mind and not commit too early to the horse you're going to bet on because the, you know, the race conditions change and everything changes so aggressively. Uh, and the paramutual price matters, maybe most of all. Okay. The road to the Indianapolis 500 later this month continues this Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern with the Indy Grand Prix on NBC and Peacock. Find out who takes the checkered flag at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway road course. Um, just quick thought on PSG Dortmund, uh, which kicks off 3 p.m. Eastern Tuesday. Uh, the PSG are minus 210 favorites on the three-way money line. They're minus 165 to advance. But we're talking about markets that are vulnerable, uh, invulnerable uh, earlier on. The Champions League money lines day again, pretty hard to beat. I'm not going to pretend uh, like I have a massive edge on PSG Dortmund in the Champions League semifinals. The only thought I'd say is that just a, a random soccer thought is that I think that when a team goes up against another that is reduced to 10 men, you get a really good insight into how well that team is coached. I'll never forget this. Well, I'm going to kind of vaguely forget it now because I forget who they were playing. But Unai Emery's <laughs> Arsenal came up against, I think, Watford with 10 men um, in his tenure. And Arsenal has had no idea how to break down 10-man Watford. And it's like, hey, what are you doing? Like, what are you practicing? Like, what is your team's philosophy? And I was very impressed, unfortunately, because I had a lot of money on Barcelona. <laughs> but when Barcelona went down to 10 against PSG, sometimes when you go up against 10 men, it's just kind of labored and you just don't really have a plan. PSG had a plan and it looked like they were going to score every time they went forward against Barcelona. And I thought it was impressive how they just ruined Barca um, in that stretch. And look, Dortmund were maybe a bit fortunate to get out of that PSG first leg with a win, uh, suspected PSG likely win um, and then go through um, as minus 165 favorites and then probably get the re well, not rematch, but they get the, the matchup with Real Madrid uh, and Killian. Uh, Mbappe's uh, likely new team next season. Well, his new team next season. All right, before we jump out in two minutes, Drew, Mavs at Thunder game one. Thunder three and a half point favorites, total to 16 and a half. Uh, Thunder series price floating around from anywhere from minus 115 to minus 130. Uh, what is your quick read on game one? Yes, yeah, so uh, Mavericks have a very, very tough test to solve the Thunder defense, in my opinion. Lou Dort especially being able to kind of really muck things up against Luka, uh, I'm excited to see. And I think the Mavericks also have a ton of answers to solve defensively against a Thunder team that can spread you out with Chet Holmgren kind of being sort of the X factor, I think, offensively for this series for the Thunder. Um, now, if Chet 
doesn't have it if he's if he's stinking up the joint then uh the thunder are gonna have to do it ugly or they're just really gonna have to lean into uh sga creating a lot of offense for this team but i think he's perfectly capable of it with the matchups that uh, he will be afforded and i think uh just in general um you know i'm i i would make this closer to four and a half uh personally and uh not a ton of rest advantage built in for the thunder to get that to that number um i just think this is a really well coached team with uh, a defense that has to be upgraded based on uh what you saw in round one of this playoff series and if you can make you know if you can make life that difficult again for uh the guards and the you know the shot creation for the mavericks in this series if luca is in any way limited physically um then this could be a short series in favor of the thunder in my opinion i bet the thunder series at this point i've had thunder features of five to one to win the west that i've heavily staked into and i think um this is going to be the team that i end up ride or dying with uh this year in the west unless um unless something weird happens and uh minnesota comes through and i have to maybe rethink things but um yeah thunder or pass here at three and a half and i think the total is probably a little too high at 216 and a half uh if you think back to the early series moments between uh mavericks and clippers and how that was just an absolute dead nut under of the series i I could entirely see this being somewhat similar to start out. Um, so I'm going to play under 216 and a half uh, on this Tuesday game as well. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, I lean Thunder as well with the series price. I'm not sure. Like for the minus 115 out there, I'm not sure that really reconciles with being a three and a half point favorite in game one, unless you think the ratings are really going to change um, for these teams. I think the two things I'm most interested in seeing. One, if Gafford and Lively can really punish OKC on the offensive class, which I think like those guys are both, you know, better than 90th percentile offensive rebounders. And that is OKC's flaw um, in theory. And then two, just whether Doncic, who held up fine um, on defense against the Clippers, whether he's actually going to get exposed by the quickness um, of Shea uh, and Jalen Williams to a lesser extent. So those would be the two things I'm looking for. Uh, I would like the Mavs to come out of the series for futures positions, but do think that OKC um, are the side. And I think they are a bet if you can find some minus 115 to minus 120. All right. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those of you watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. Also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. We'll see you soon.